John Conway's theories. Um, so it's a it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Derek Fretlow um, for this seminar. He's going to speak to us on, in this seminar, and he's going to talk about uh, unusual normal tidings, both unusual and normal in the same. Uh, name. Um, so uh, just to let you know that uh, he's uh, broadly interested in discrete math, algebra, and geometry, and um, uh, specifically in tilings, convex polytopes, symmetry groups, finitely presented groups, hyperbolic geometry, graph theory, combinatorics, uh, model sets, diffraction, uh, self-similarity, and fractals. That, that's a whole lot of things that he's interested in. Uh, but today he's going to talk to us about unusual normal tilings, which is has something to do with two of his collaborative uh, work that's ongoing. Um, so take it away from here, Professor Jack. And thank you for being here. Oh, yes. And thank you for the nice introduction. And hello, all together. And also thank you for the opportunity to present something here. And, um, whoops, these are the slides I should mention. <clears throat> please feel free to ask at any time. If you like, please somehow make me aware of you. And please also let me mention that uh, the slides, if you are interested in the slides, then you can find them as follows. Let's say, go to your favorite, <clears throat> whoopsie, go to your favorite search engine, enter my name. Then you will find Dirk Fredlö, Uni Bielefeld, that's my alma mater and on my homepage, you, at the bottom, you can see a link to the exact slides I'm showing here. So, good. So, if you want to wind forward or wind back, then you are able to do it now. Okay. Um, then, um, this talk shows how a seemingly simple, harmless question can inspire a lot of mathematical research, a lot of work. In this sense, it's maybe typical. Um, but okay, in another sense, it's not very typical because it's very concrete. It's no deep structural theorem. It's uh, many somehow sophisticated constructions. And good, in order to start, I first want to explain two of the words in the title. First, I want to explain what tilings are. Maybe you are familiar with it, maybe not, but the tiling is something that covers the plane. So by nice shapes, maybe by polytopes, maybe by squares. You all have seen a square tiling probably in your life whenever you look at grid paper or at some tiling at the floor of the floor. Then um, this Naya is a tiling. And for the purpose of this talk, we want to think of tiling as a tiling of the entire plane. So again, for instance, here on the left in this image, we see a tiling, okay, not of the plane because the plane is infinite. This is part of an infinite tiling, but you can easily imagine how it extends beyond this image, it extends uh, to the entire plane. And um, okay, the requirement is that these, in this case, these uh, pentagons, they do not overlap and they leave no gaps. Yeah, that's what the tiling is. The tiling is a covering as well as a packing. No overlaps and no gaps between the tiles. 
Good. And here in this in these two examples, um, the tilings are convex polygons, and in general, the shape of such tiles can be very difficult, can be fractal in nature or whatever. But during this talk, I will consider tiles that are convex polygons, like squares and hexagons and so on. And by the way, when I later say pentagon, hexagon, I always mean convex hexagons, pentagons, and so on. Good. And one property a tiling oops, can or cannot have is being vertex to vertex. By which I mean, this is one thing I explain now, it will become relevant later. By which I mean, the tiling is called vertex to vertex. If the vertex of each tile, yeah, by vertex, I mean a corner of this polygon. This corner also meets corners. This vertex of this tile here meets only vertices of the other tiles here. Yeah, this left one is vertex to vertex. And the right one, the blue example, here we have a situation where the upper two pentagons have a vertex at this position, but the lower pentagon has not, right? So this right example is not vertex to vertex. And the left example is. Another way to phrase it is shown here below. So if the intersection of two tiles is always a full edge, which is the case here, intersection of these two tiles is this full edge, or intersection is vertex or empty, then it's vertex to vertex. And here, this property is violated. Intersection of this pentagon and this pentagon is this half edge of now, yeah, both of these pentagons. OK, that's what a tiling is. That's what a vertex to vertex tiling is. Ah, and by the way, a tiling is also known as a tessellation. If you look on Wikipedia, it's tessellation. Also known, it's also known as tiling. Okay, and here it's tiling, also known as tessellation. Whoops. And OK, tiling now is explained. Now I want to explain what a normal tiling is. In the, the, the definition is written up here. A normal tiling is called normal if there are two radii, 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 if there are two values, small r, capital R, such that each tile is contained in a disk of radius small r. And uh, no, sorry, each tile contains a disk of radius small r. This in should be omitted. That's a mistake. Um, so each tile contains a small disk of fixed radius, and each tile is contained in a large disk of radius capital R which in plain words means that tiles become not arbitrarily thin. Yeah, that's the first condition. And tiles become not arbitrarily large. So in this very, very simple example of uh, tiling by unit squares, vertex to vertex tiling by unit squares, you have seen this several times probably. Um, this is, of course, normal. Yeah, each square contains some disk of radius, whatever, one half, say. And each square is contained in a large disk of radius uh, two, say. Yeah, so this tiling is no, uh, this tiling is normal. Um, yeah, pretty normal. Can there be normal tilings? Yes. Let in, we construct a tiling by fol as follows. From the unit square tiling, we take just one square and cut it in half. 
and we keep the right half, but for the less left half, we cut it in half again. And the left half of this quarter square will be cut into two halves again. And the left half of this will be cut into, okay, and so on and so on and so on. Infinitely many often. Okay, what do we see? We see a tiling of the plane, no gaps, no overlaps. But these tiling, this tiling is not longer normal. Yeah, because we see tiles that are arbitrarily thin. So not each tile contains a disk of whatever radius small r. Good, okay. These are the two uh, or three important terms here. Tiling, normal tiling, vertex to vertex tiling. Are there questions up to here? Okay, as mentioned, feel free to ask anytime. Okay, first part. Together with my German colleague Christian Richter from Jena. Um, let me start here. Um, if you have a look at this blog by some, yeah, what colleague from India, but he explains himself as a what computer scientist, computer engineer, and hobby mathematician. But still, he, uh, on this blog for several years now, he asks pretty interesting questions. One question led to papers on the so-called spicy chicken theorem. So if you look at your favorite search engine up, spicy chicken theorem, then you will find some math research that's related to a question this guy asked. And that's not what I want to talk about here. He also asked another question. And this question is, is there a tiling of the plane by three conditions now? Pairwise non-congruent triangles, but all of the triangles should have equal area, say all triangles having area one, and all shall have the same perimeter. Okay, and pairwise non congruent This means all triangles look different from each other. No two are congruent. Still, they all have, say, unit area, they all have the same perimeter. That was his question. And the answer is no. So three colleagues, two Hungarian and one Russian colleague, considered this question, found it intriguing, and they, in fact, were able to prove um, that there is no such thing. So all three requirements are too much. There's no tiling by pairwise non congruent triangles, area one, equal perimeter. Good. Then, okay, this question is answered. No, it's answered. End of the game. No, of course not. We can vary the question. We can, for instance, if all three things are too much to ask for, we can drop the perimeter condition. So we only want non congruent triangles, all area one. Uh, excuse me. Uh, when, uh... Are there some example where this situation occurs or it is impossible that, uh, that we can do so? Um, you will see some examples. Um, yes, there are here. Yeah. Mm, yes, uh, wait, do I need to? Answer is yes, example is here and uh, it's, strange to look at this it looks a little bit like an optical illusion but mm -hmm. the idea the following uh, and in fact it's due to one of my students i just gave this as an exercise in some course can you find such a unit area non-congruent triangle 
tiling. And the idea is as follows. Let's consider this strip down here. We take one strip of width, water of width, W, and then we consider the half infinite strip extending yeah, to infinity here. And then we cut off one triangle of area one. We can do this. And then we cut off another triangle of area one. We can do this. And we cut off another triangle of area one and so on. So we can fill tap, 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 this strip with infinitely many triangles of area one. And then we do this with a strip of different width and of different width and of different width and so on. We continue up and down. We have infinitely many strips of all different widths. That's easy to achieve. Then we have tiled half the plane, but then we play the same game on the left side of the left, <clears throat> on the left half plane. And um, yeah, done. Okay. And, uh, yep. Isn't it uh, paradoxical because uh, the strips are getting smaller and smaller in the area? Oh, area remains the same, perimeter remains the same, but they are getting more closer, just like Zeno's paradox. Like getting but, closer, but still so far. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. I agree. That's why that's the usual instinct. Usually you would say, wow, that's not nice. That's not what we are looking for. That's somehow pathologic, this example. Mm. Um, and the same here. Okay, that's mm -hmm. what Nanda Kumar himself already thought. When I drop the perimeter requirement, then I can play the following game. Now let's consider the upper right quadrant and then cut off a unit area, uh, unit area or area half here, cut off another triangle of the same area, cut off another triangle, the same area, keep on zigzagging here. In the, finally, you fill the upper right quadrant, play the same game with the other three quadrants. And again, you get some kind of pathological example. So this question is maybe too simple, or it leads to strange examples, but we see that this tiling is not normal, and the last one isn't, because the triangles become arbitrarily thin. And so maybe we want the following, so we can ask, is there a normal tiling of the plane by two of these conditions, pairwise non-congruent, triangles, and equal area. Okay, and this is somehow more tricky. So, the construction, it is possible, answer is yes. And um, the construction is a variant of the last one. Yeah, consider we consider the upper right quadrant and then again, keep cutting off triangles in a zigzagging way. But whenever the triangles become too thin, then introduce one ray here emanating from x1 continuing to infinity, splitting the upper right quadrant into two parts. And so in each of the two parts now play the same game. Cut off unit area triangles, unless they become too thin, introduce a new ray. And the same here. And so on. in each of the four areas here, now regions here, now play the same game zigzag of triangles whenever they become too thin, add an infinite ray and continue. Yep, so this works. So the this construction can be found in these two publications. But um, in fact, in the first one, um, there is only a hand waving proof why it works. Yeah, it's fair to say the first one uh, contains the construction, but the second one, again, it's another one by the two Hungarian colleagues and the Russian colleagues. They have the same construction, but they have a careful proof that, in fact, yeah, what's the problem? All triangles can be made non congruent to each other. 
Good. Okay, this question answered. One even harder version is we have seen the property vertex to vertex and going back one slide. This example is now normal, equal area, pairwise no congruent, but it's not vertex to vertex. Here we see several not vertex to vertex situations. So in a sense, combinatorially, these are not triangles. Geometrically, they, these are of course triangles, but okay, however you want to think of, about this. Good, it's not vertex to vertex. So we can also ask, is there a vertex, a normal vertex to vertex tiling of the plane by pairwise non congruent triangles of the same area? We now add the requirement vertex to vertex. And this is not so easy, but together with Christian, we found a construction that works and it's a different approach. We start again with a strip and now a bi-infinite strip extending in both directions to infinity. And uh, we tile this strip with, now yeah, with congruent triangles, with right angled, say area one triangles, isosceles right angle triangles. So up to now they are all congruent. But now we want to move this point at the origin upwards, say, on the y axis. We move this a little bit from zero, zero to, yep, <clears throat> zero, y, zero. And we keep all the properties. So we move this point, but re we require um, that now yeah, the triangles stay triangles, that the topology is unchanged. So triangles share an edge before, share, share an edge later and so on. And we want uh, what? Ah, for later purposes, we want the result to be mirror symmetric. So here I show only half the strip, the right half of the strip. Here's the origin, here is the moved up point. And then the, uh, yeah, the triangles are somehow distorted. And uh, in fact, whatever this, uh, this, Moving this one parameter, moving the point up by an amount of y0 um, determines everything. So when we do this and we require the thing to be symmetric, then these two half triangles here um, are determined. And by these, these two further, everything else is determined by this one parameter. Good. Okay. Uh Okay, yep. uh, one, uh, here's one question. So it means uh, we have to tile the floor with uh, with some pool of triangles which are non congruent. But yes. uh, uh, what about uh, T1, 4, T2, 4, T3, 4, T4, 4? Uh, there um, seems to be the congruent triangles, right? Ah, this is because they differ only on a microscopic scale. If we push this point up and do the computations, then mm -hmm. here, this point has coordinates x1, x1, y1, and this has x2, y2. And if we do the computations, we saw that the height of this triangle is different from this height, mm. and different from this height, and different from this height. So a lot of these triangles are already non congruent, mm. even though you cannot see it. It's microscopic it's in this sense it's a strange condition being non-congruent can be pretty invisible mm -hmm. okay but okay that's exactly what we do mm, we are first um yes first let's say this um we take such a distorted strip and in fact, there are congruent triangles, namely the counterpart of this in the left-hand side is congruent to T14. And so 
But what we do now is to apply a shear. So we move by a linear map, we move the upper line to the right and keeping the lower line there. Then we get sheared copies of this strip. Say maybe this was, this is a sheared copy of the original strip. And now it's sheared. Now these two are not longer congruent. And then we have one strip and then we take another sheared copy of the strip upside down and place it on top. And we take another sheared copy of the strip and place it on top of the second one. And then the upside down copy of the another sheared one and so on. And so we continue up, 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 up and down. Of course, now there are two things to show. That's the construction. And why does this construction work? It's pretty <clears throat> lengthy. It's, in fact, uh, maybe with respect to the computations, one of the my lengthier papers. We need to show that the times are normal so that our distortion of the point at the origin does not have the effect that tiles far out become thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And we have to show long congruence. Okay, and uh, I will not take uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, what about the shear effects on uh, the left side and right side? Uh, it will only be applied on the central strip or it will affect the others? Oh, ah, no, each strip is sheared individually. So I take mm -hmm. one copy of a strip, shear it. Mm -hmm. Take this copy, bap, put it on my plane. Mm -hmm. Then another one, sheared by another shear map. Mm -hmm. bap, put as the second. Uh, why, why do you have to reflect the, why do you take the shear ah. in one direction and the other one? Why is that important? Um, third requirement, we want to get a vertex to vertex tiling. And within the strip, we started with vertex to vertex. We did some nice thing. We keep it vertex to vertex. Mm -hmm. But in order to ensure that uh, the boundary between two strips is vertex to vertex, we need to make use of the fact that yeah, the upper side of this one matches exactly the lower side of the white one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Yeah, Thank you. you're welcome. Thanks for asking. Um, right, so vertex to vertex is easy. That's by construction. We need to show that the tiles are normal, that triangles become not too distorted, uh, that all triangles are pairwise no congruent. And that's a lot of work. I will only sketch it and this below here, don't look at the formulas. It's just to show you that we have a lot of inequalities and a lot of geometric series and so on in order to do this. First, we determine the ex value, exact values of the yi. So remember the y zero is the one we can choose to move and the yi is the height of all the other triangles. And if we have exact values of yi, we can show that all the heights, for instance, are different. So the at least the triangles in the bottom row are all non-congruent. And we can having um, exact having the exact values, we can also show that um, this deviation is bounded or maybe better the deviation of the x i of the x coordinates. Let me go back two pages. Here is the x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, and so on. And the y i gives us x i. And if the deviation of the y i is bounded, then 
the deviation of the xi is bounded, and so we achieve normal. And then all triangles within the strip are pairwise non congruent. That's still more work. One thing we exploit is that we have uncountably many choices. We have uh, a continuous parameter, uncountably many choices to, for y0. And uh, whenever we have placed strips, we have placed only finitely many strips, so finitely, uh, so countably many triangles. And so one important thing is that we use the uncountably many choices. Okay, and at least here we have, we did our job and had a very uh, precise detailed proof. Okay, but now let's step back a little and look at the entire situation. We have considered um, already a few variations of the original question. Original question was essentially this one. Yeah, our box here is for triangles. If we ask for equal area tiling with equal parameter. Yeah, that's here. Oops, sorry, it's up. And we have seen that the question here is no. Kopavsky Pachtado showed that there are no equal parameter, equal area, non congruent triangle tiles. First column being vertex to vertex, second column being not vertex to vertex, but they showed that there is no vertex to vertex tiling, uh, no, not vertex to vertex, no example at all. So by showing this, they automatically showed this because this is the stricter thing. Yeah, in general, here in the, uh, oops, <clears throat> they showed the stronger thing, right? This is the more special thing. In general, in this, within each box here, uh, the question becomes harder if we go down and left, and the question becomes easier if we go up and right. Yeah, asking for something in vertex to vertex is more restrictive than not having this requirement. And also being of equal parameter is a stronger requirement than being only normal. Okay, so, um, this about triangles, but the box is down here. It's, of course, we can uh, think of other variants of the questions by stating, by uh, asking the question, not for triangles, but for convex quadrangles, for convex pentagons, for convex hexagons. Uh, please keep in mind that I always talk of complex uh, convex polygons. Good, okay. Um, we have seen another case. We have seen this here. That was uh, the paper where I found the construction and Kopavsky, Kupavsky, Pachtado showed that it actually worked. And then the last example we have seen with the sheared copies of the distorted strip was the vertex to vertex normal equal area instance of the question for triangles. Okay, what about the other ones? We can ask the question for quadrangles, pentagons, hexagons. That's in fact uh, contained already in my 2018 paper. And it turns out that in general, these are easier. So let's consider the Pentagon case. Um, here, the following approach works. Let's start with the tiling by these large Pentagons. Yeah, like in my first example on the yeah, almost very first slide, there was 
tilings by these house-like, house-shaped uh, pentagons side by side. And now, uh, of course, all these large pentagons are congruent to each other, but let's dissect this large pentagon into six smaller pentagons, essentially like this shown here in this way. And then if we have <clears throat> um, dissected the large pentagon like this, let's say we have some freedom of wiggling vertex one around a little bit. And then we can adjust vertex two in order to have the unit area, the equal area condition. Yeah, we have some freedom to wiggle this vertex around. And then with vertex two, we can keep the old area. And um, after this, still we have freedom we adjust this vertex two in one direction, but after having fixed the correct area for the lower left pentagon, we can still move vertex two along this line. So we have a lot of freedom in order to have lower left pentagon of area one. Okay, and then we continue to play this game. After we have fixed vertex two, we can use vertex three to keep this pentagon of the correct area and then we still have the freedom to move three up and down a little bit. And the same we do with this pentagon in vertex four. And then we have only uh, one choice, but there is a unique choice determined by all the choices we have made so far to make these two pentagons of the correct area. And then automatically the sixth one has to keep the remaining area, which makes it then correct. Okay, and now it's essentially clear how to play the game. Um, we take a pentagon and um, divide it in such a way, and we have uncountably many ways to subdivide it, and then we use copies of the differently subdivided pentagons in order to tie the plane, and okay, so that's not very hard. This is a simple way how we can solve this one. So in general, the upshot is that if I go from top to bottom, then the it also becomes easier. And if I go from uh, what down left to up right in each box, then it becomes easier. We also did the equal parameter um, thing for pentagons. So recall that equal area and equal parameter wasn't possible for triangles, but it is possible for pentagons. Again, showing that somehow pentagons are simpler. Um, and this, in fact, was is a preprint only. That's only three pages. But we have also solved this again harder case. If we go from this box to this book, then we expect the question to be harder. And yes, it is. In fact, unlike with triangles for convex quadrangles, it's true that there is a tiling by incongruent quadrangles of equal area and equal parameter. So here this hard requirement can be fulfilled. And this recently appeared in this journal, which is pretty decent. And it's a pretty lengthy proof. It takes a similar approach. We take again a strip tiled originally with equilateral tilings, and then we distort the origin, and then we stack sheared copies and so on. And in this way, we can get uh, tiling by, um, again, by equal area triangles. And now 
we split each of these equal area triangles in the correct way into four quadrangles. And again, we have some freedom here how to do this. And in this way, we can achieve that all the parameters of the quadrangles are equal. And then again, we use the trick. We have infinitely many, uncountably many ways to dissect these almost equilateral triangles into uh, and so on. Good. So we have seen this. Um, and now one thing that might catch the eye is that um, I said, if we go to the box, ouch. <clears throat> Um, from lower left to upper right, it gets harder. Yeah, for triangles and quadrangles and triangles, it's true, and pentagons, it's true. But for hexagons, it's different. For hexagons, it's somehow this case was um, ah, solved already in a more Ah, yeah, in the quadrangle paper, it was just an appendix, just a short con construction, but we solve the vertex to vertex case, but not the not vertex to vertex case. Um, the not vertex to vertex case was again in another paper of us. And the funny thing is that usually not vertex to vertex is the weaker requirement. It's easier to achieve, but for hexagons, it's the other way around. For convex hexagons, it's harder to find non-vertex to vertex examples than vertex to vertex examples. Of course, hexagons, easiest example of a hexagon tiling is the regular honeycomb tiling. Yeah, regular hexagons, putting them vertex to vertex is a regular tiling. And this is naya yeah, vertex to vertex. So it's hard to find non-vertex to vertex tilings with they are any um, property. So for us, it was again, we wanted non-congruent hexagons. So again, you can imagine that with the, each hexagon here is slightly distorted so that all of them on microscopic scale are non-congruent, but mostly this, our example for the non-vertex to vertex case, it is mostly vertex to vertex. It has only two non-vertex to vertex situations here indicated by the red arrows. So this again, caught for interest. Yeah, it's again, we see how the question ev questions evolved. It started with triangles and now we somehow filled in most of the entire table, all of the, what, 16 cases. And now we stumbled upon the question, whoops, can we achieve? Yeah, what's the natural question that arises here? How many non-vertex to vertex situations can a tiling by convex hexagons have? Yeah, we try to construct some and um, it was difficult to find them. So let's illustrate. Ah, let's phrase a similar question. Um, if we asked about non vertex to vertex situations in a hexagon tiling, here left we see three hexagons and we see a non vertex to vertex situations in a hexagon tiling. And some people may find it more natural to consider this a heptagon, or in other words, we can translate this situation easily into a situations where we are vertex to vertex, but this now is a heptagon. So that's in fact a fact. A non-vertex to vertex situation in a hexagon tiling um, corresponds to a heptagon in a vertex-to-vertex -vertex tiling, where most other 
tiles are hexagons. Good. Okay, so we can ask if we have a tiling by convex hexagons, how many convex heptagons, seven gons, can we throw in and still have a nice tiling? Um, <clears throat> and if we ask this, then, uh, yeah, then we see that there are tilings by heptagons only. It looks a lot of a tiling in the hyperbolic plane, but this should be the Euclidean plane. And so we see a regular heptagon in the center, surrounded by seven heptagons, surrounded by several heptagons, surrounded by even more heptagons. And in fact, one can tile the entire plane by convex heptagons. And again, Many people would say this is not what we looked for. This is ugly, but we can, of course, ask the more decent question, or maybe the one we wanted, we aimed at. <clears throat> we <coughs> can ask how many heptagons can a normal tiling by convex n-gons have if we only have if we have only hexagons and heptagons. If only these are allowed, how many heptagons can be there in a normal typing? Otherwise, the answer is everything can be heptagons. Okay, problem is illustrated here. So it's somehow, for me, it's always tempting start to construct something and say we start with an infinite number of heptagons arranged like this, or in this case, an infinite number. Yeah, if you distort this vertex slightly, then we see heptagons. Or we can take the other point of view and say these are all hexagons. And here are infinitely many non-vertex to vertex situations. But, and let's try to extend this with hexagons to a tiling, but we face if we try it we face the problem that we are forced to somehow add smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner tiles whatever you try the resulting tiling will not be normal okay in fact we found out only after we asked this question that this question has an answer already the answer is we can have at most finitely many heptagons. So in fact, this large approach is doomed to fail because I started with infinitely many heptagons. But the correct answer is we can have only finitely many heptagons. And that's a PhD brother of mine, if you like. He at the same university with the same PhD advisor. He graduated in 89 already. And in his PhD thesis, he showed that there can only be finitely many heptagons in a tiling by hexagons and heptagons. And very recently, Arseni, a colleague, um, found a short proof for this, a one-page proof for this, and he also achieved not only the proof of this theorem, but he achieved an upper bound. So how can there be an upper bound? The upper bound is in terms of um, maximal diameter and minimal area. So if you like this D over A here, diameter divided by area, is a measure of how normal the tiling is. Yeah, if we see a large diameter and a small minimal area, then this is a large number and the tiling is very not normal, if you like. Yeah, very thin and very small tiles. Good. And if, of course, maximal diameter is bounded by something very tight and minimal area is bounded by something very tight, then there are only 
few hexagons. Okay, and what is remaining now? Um, this is an upper bound. Stehling and Akopian tell us only that uh, it's at most this number, but uh, maybe the correct answer is seven or two or something. So that's not true. The, our result shows that um, there are arbitrarily many. So in fact, we can have arbitrarily many. It's not only an upper bound, but arbitrary many is the true answer. In more detail, also first we also now answer, having answered the heptagon question, we also have answered the non-vertex to vertex situation question. And here it's a pretty simple construction. Yeah, it's a very short paper, but I like pictures and I like the result. So I show this. And what's the construction? How can we get arbitrarily many heptagons? We start with this regular hexagon tiling, and then we consider these wedges here, the gray parts, and take, oops, uh, sorry, jetzt nicht. And we take these wedges, we squeeze them, and by this, we now can arrange more of them around a central tile. So we take the squeezed wedges, say 12 rather than six here, and we place them around a central three N gone, here a 12 gone. Then we dissect the three N gone into N heptagons, and we fill the remaining gaps between these wedges. And we can squeeze the wedges a lot, arbitrarily uh, thin, and still the tiling will be normal, but with a high normality factor, if you like. And so in the center, we can also place a 3000 gone and get a thousand heptagons. Good, this is how we achieve arbitrarily many. And in order to compare with the bound, they have an upper bound, at most such many heptagons. How good is it if we plug in this bound or if we count the heptagons in our simple construction? Yeah, it's not a very tricky construction, should be simple, but it's actually pretty good. The number of heptagons in our construction counted with respect to this parameter n, divided by a copian's bound is three over four. So it's really now in a 75% range upper and lower bound. Uh, worst case lower bound, if you like. Good, okay, I think that's... May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so, so this part two started out with um with this question of, of counting how many non-vertex uh, to vertex situations one may have. Uh, you, I, I didn't quite catch what connection that has with the number of heptagons a tiling would have. Maybe you said it, but I didn't quite catch the connection. No problem, that's here the point. Any non-vertex to vertex situation in a hexagon tiling, here we have three hexagons, Mm -hmm. corresponds to a heptagon in vertex to vertex tiling. So counting these things, the non-vertex to vertex situations in a hexagon tiling is exactly the same as counting heptagons. Refer to vertex, right. Yeah, but vertex to vertex, right. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Maybe I browse to it over too quickly. So mm -hmm. thanks for asking. Good, but in fact, um, now we see this worst case lower bound is already 75% of the uh, known upper bound. That's actually all what I wanted to tell you. So thanks for attention.
Right. Thank you very much for a, for a lovely talk. It's just, um, it's quite awe inspiring. <laughs> um, yeah, the questions are very easy to pose, but you know the, un the answers like. It seems as though there's there's a lot that's going on uh, in the background that you, you didn't talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we can move to questions. Uh, right, Dr. Imran Anwar has a question. Yeah, uh, it was a wonderful talk, uh, Rick, uh, and uh, quite an unusual because uh, uh, we are used to see the tiling as a rigid geometry, right? And uh, definitely you was using the rigid geometry, but uh, on the same time, you were using topological tools somehow, some wish, some <clears throat> uh, shear stress, you are sharing the things. And uh, it seems to me like uh, the plane is converted into a topological sheet. And uh, where definitely metric is important, but uh, uh, the, main, the main idea of uh, this kind of tiling, uh, uh, does it have any connection with the Penrose tiling? And uh, if I talk about the Escher, Escher work, and uh, there are lots of uh, Escher work, which is in my office too, uh, which <laughs> is uh, where the pattern is keep on squeezing, squeezing, and keep on increasing, and nothing looks the same. No pattern goes on. So I would like to see how to prove these particular facts. So how, uh, so basically you are uh, looking at the dimension, the convergence and limits you showed there in order to see that uh, no tile is uh, maintaining the same length. So congruences are being distorted, but uh, the area is the same. Uh, this is very, very difficult. Uh, difficult question to answer. So mm -hmm. there are two uh, two questions. So this is an unconventional way of tiling. And the second question is, uh, how did you manage in order to approach these particular results? Oh, sorry, the last? How, how did you approach to address the problem uh, which ensures that uh, the triangles are non-congruent and uh, the area is the same and oh. the perimeter is the same uh, in the beginning problem. Yeah, if we think um, of the distorted strip example of uh, this one, then uh, the <clears throat> The area condition is by construction. So when I say mm. this shifting parameter y0 determines mm. everything, it determines everything because we require the triangles to be of equal area. And this mm. equal area condition gives us, for instance, once this point is fixed, it gives us the coordinates of this point uniquely, and then in turn of this one, and then in turn of this one, and ta ta. Uh, so un unit area is by construction and then problem is to show the other requirements that they are all different and oops, in fact, that's ooh, hard to tell, but it's really in some sense, it's metric geometry really, because mm -hmm. we want coordinates and we use the coordinates in order to show something. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is quite surprising. Uh, otherwise, uh, whenever the tiling things are being under discussion, so people talk about the symmetries and uh, group theory comes into play, but uh, there we can't see anything. Uh, this, is, uh, this is completely new for me. Thank you for these elaborations. Thanks for your questions. I think any... Sorry, are you, you, you're going to say something, please. Yeah, I think you really have a point because uh, maybe this is why this question hasn't been asked. Being pairwise incongruent, it's such a strange thing. I actually usually work on Penrose tilings mm -hmm. where 
we have finitely many tiles and some nice symmetries and some nice algebraic, uh, it lives in some nice algebraic field or ring or something. If you look up in your favorite search engine tilings encyclopedia, then this is one of my projects, a zoo of nice tilings. First, it will provide you with nice images, maybe with nice wallpaper. And mm -hmm. then you see what I was um, interested in before I stumbled on this strange, unusual, non congruent tiles. Mm -hmm. I definitely I, I I don't see uh, whether somebody used these particular tools uh, for topological invariance measurement because in topology metric doesn't matter at all. One just concern about uh, the triangulations. So the yeah. above above strip and the lower strip is the same in topology. Right, right, and um, maybe it's. I think we are doing it in not the best way because I think, uh, and this might be the bridge to apology. In these questions, what one really should do is uh, think of the number of free parameters. And the number of free parameters is somehow a dimension question. If in this pentagon example, maybe I have um, two, three, four, five parameters. I have a five dimensional parameter space here and maybe restricted by poof, something. That's, I think that's how it is supposed to be done. Hmm. Oh, okay. I will look into it. Thank you, Professor. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, ask a quick one. So I was wondering, even with your example of the distorted uh, strip, and even over here, you see, you have you have like these um, infinitely many choices, which which work. Um, so how do you keep so does this also lead to, um, yeah, I mean, so is the answer as simple as that, that there are a lot and, it, and infinitely many solutions to the problem, or do you, are you also interested in counting uh, of sorts? Um, and my second question is that, you know, with, with so many, um, you know, uh, free variables, you know, this wiggling each of these vertices to achieve the desired area and all, and then patching them together to find a tiling. Um, what kind of tools do you require from math? Um, can, can you name them? Because it seems like a lot of work to compare and to know that, you know, every time you're patching, uh, you know, these pentagons together, you know, there's, there's no congruence. In, I mean, it's, it's really, it, it, it looks uh, like impossible somehow. <laughs> Thanks for this question. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, to illuminate the difference here, the argument really is we do some distortions, pop, 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 one, two, three, four, and place the thing. Okay, now we have finitely many pentagons placed already, six. And then we have um, for the next one, uncountably many choices uncountable is the point. Whatever, even if we have placed infinitely many pentagons already, we have only used countably many choices. And we use our freedom to find something in the uncountable space of pentagons uh, that's not used already. That's just a counting argument with respect to the cardinalities. <laughs> That's very different uh, for the other ones. Asking which tools, that's essentially really inequalities. Uh -huh. We use an exact parameterization and then we use that a finite geometric series is, uh, can be bounded to the infinite version and um, some tricks of the trade and so on. 
and for the, in fact, for the um, quadrangle case, we surprisingly used the uh, implicit function theorem. So we have a lot of uh, algebraic functions, or say nice functions. And they have a derivative and they are zero somewhere, which is the periodic one, which is where all triangles are equal. And there the value of something is zero. And then we can use the implicit function theorem to say that ah, somewhere around here is another solution or so. So, but it's not having one perfect tool to use for everything. It's really ad hoc. We have a problem and we need our toolbox to find a tool that works for some particular purpose. Uh, from this per particular answer, I can say that uh, basically uh, you are constructing some tools. If there is a very, uh, uh, there is a, there exists a perfect tiling. So currently you are building some particular methods which can distort that tiling where congruence is being maintained and being distorted. And uh, I, 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 I just, uh, uh, I'm just curious about the, the technique what you applied in the earlier cases. Can you apply the same technique with the quadrilateral? So in how many angles, minimum angles are needed in order to tweak the tiling, distort the tiling, and you, you are creating the distortions. Uh, you understand my question if I- uh, Sorry, frankly, no, please. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, when you was doing the case of the triangles, so you adopted a particular tiling and then you distorted the strip and then some shear stress applied. And okay, one can think of why the same technique can can't be applied in the gain of, uh, in the case of the quadrilateral, in the case of pentagon. If one applies that same method on that particular technique, what kind of issues popped up? So then you come up that uh, one more angle or two more angle need to be tweaking, need tweaking, and then you goes on. So is there some methodology developing from your results that uh, one can perfect the perfect tiling and then one can apply this method to distort it or the second method to distort it or the third method? Okay. Yes, yes, um, exactly. But the other way around, so our first um, trick was actually this one, take a finite piece and have ideally several ways, several free parameters, and then use copies of the finite piece. Mm -hmm. And with triangles, this simple idea did not succeed. And so we switched to the idea of, okay, we don't take a finite tile, dissect it into finite, we take an infinite strip. And so in this sense, yes, there was, in this sense, these methods were reused from simpler to harder cases. Mm, okay, thank you. Court, yes. Right, if, uh, are there any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Professor Dirk again for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much and very illuminating. Um, so, uh, Dr. Ran, do you have any advertisements for next week? Or yeah, uh, I need to advertise uh, the next seminar. Uh, Professor Dirk, uh, do you know Martin Gruel from Kesa Salatan? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, our next speaker is Martin Gruel. In the next week, on the same time, so Martin Gruel is going to talk about semi-continuity of families of power series and application to singularity invariance and computational algorithm. Uh, just to tell you, Martin Gruel is a famous mathematician in Germany, just like Dirk, and uh, <laughs> because uh, he has been uh, the president of uh, Oberwolf for a year, and uh, he's the found he's the father of uh, singular who uh, computer alg algorithm computational algorithm software 
widely used in algebraic geometry and other other things. So he will be talking about these three points: semi-continuity of families of power series. Uh, uh, this is particularly this talk is based on uh, some recently uh, held Oberwolf X school, and uh, he's going to share some. Uh, I would say I would say some excerpt of the output of that uh, one month Oberwolf X school. Okay, over to you, Hania. This is the advertisement for the next seminar on the same time. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, so maybe we can call it a day. And thanks again to Professor Derek for a lovely talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.